Good morning, brothers and sisters, as we return to our study in the book of Judges today. Shall we praise God for his leading, for the opportunities that he presents us, so that our minds may be more open to his truth, that we may seek for his wisdom, so that we may more clearly understand the items and the examples and the symbols that are being presented to us in, this, in these passages. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, we seek your wisdom. We praise you for the opportunities that we have to learn of you, to be guided by you, to be directed by you. Help us, Father, that we may follow that which you are showing us, that we may also learn from you, so that we will be more prepared to give this message that you would want given to this earth at this time in its history. We have great need of you. We have great need of your spirit because it is through your spirit that we are instructed. We need instruction in sin, righteousness, and in judgment. May your angels also attend us so that we may be able to understand more clearly and not be distracted. Help us now be with us in all things so that your will is done. Be with us now. Guide us, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now yesterday, as we were finishing up the study, the premise had been put forward that the study of Samson is going to present the elements of the messages of Revelation 14 and of righteousness by faith. Does anyone have a problem with that? Any questions or further comments? I mean, it, it seems pretty clear uh, that the message of Samson is focused upon righteousness by faith. It's bring it because we've been brought now to the proclamation of the third angel's message. And it's going to be illustrated in the life of Samson. We're also going to be seeing as we go through this that Samson is given a variety of tests. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be able to take those tests and classify them as three specific steps. So as the gospel is a three-step prophetic testing message. Mm -hmm. We will be able to look at the life of Samson, and I think we will see a series of three steps where Samson, in the decisions that he makes, turns his back on the three-step prophetic testing message where he was raised up to be a judge of the tribe of Dan. So he was to be a judge of judges. He turns his back spiritually on the message that he is to give. And, and we could say with Samson, because this is a zooming into, because when you look at those three steps, 
we know that each waymark typifies every other waymark. Right. And that, um, but when we look at Samson, it's not, if, well, the way that I guess we can look at it is we've been moving in this movement to this third step. And, and the story of Samson is going to illustrate this history that's, that, that we're just beginning. That's the way that I understand the story of Samson. Okay. So it has three steps, but it's not, we wouldn't take the story of Samson and lay it over top of our whole line. No. Right, because it's a zoom into the third angel's message, which is where we come to the Sunday law. And Can we know that, that our line is is a, a preparation for the Sunday law. <clears throat> this is going to be illustrating the proclamation of the Sabbath in the time of the Sunday law. To use, that's, yeah, that's the way that I've seen it anyway. But anyway, I mean, we, we use the term zoom in. And I look at it as more of a micro examination. Okay. So we have, we have this situation where we go into greater detail into the micro where in many of the other lines that we've been dealing with, we've been dealing more with a macro or wider view. So Samson is going to show us some things that may be a little difficult for some to address because these are going to be very uncomfortable. Manoah means rest and Zora right. means dawn or light. So I think we're going to be coming into some light here. Oh, we're, we're most definitely going to have quite a bit of light. So this paragraph that is before us as, as we go back into the verses, why is there so much misery and suffering in the world today? Is it because God loves to see his creatures miserable? No. It is because the immoral habits of man have weakened his physical, his mental, and his moral powers. We mourn over Adam's transgression and seem to think that our first parents showed great weakness in yielding to temptation. But if Adam's transgression were the only evil we had to meet, the world would be in a much better condition than it is. There has been a succession of falls since Adam's day. I read this passage. It is not that long ago for me where I was in an Adventist church. I was in a Seventh day Adventist church, listening to a pastor make the comment that Adam and Eve didn't really do anything wrong. Oh. Now, how any Adventist could come to that type of conclusion is very much beyond me. How any Adventist pastor would have the guts to present something like that on a Sabbath is absolutely appalling as far as I am concerned. So nobody got up and said anything? Nope. I didn't even say anything. When I heard it, I was just, ab I, I mean, I listened, I heard it, and then it was brought to my attention by a friend later. Mm. How could you sit through this? Well, how did they sit through it? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're probably all in shock, maybe. So, but it was not that that much later that this same pastor had a, a sermon that we should not fear the lake of fire. 
we should just consider consider that the lake of fire is just daddy taking us to the lake. That was the one that tore it for me that I could no longer associate myself with that particular church. Uh So then the woman, the wife of Manoah, the mother of Samson, Manoah, she was the wife of rest. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of, the, of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not where he, whence he was, neither told me he his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So she is repeating this admonition to her husband. She is saying, this is what was told to me. This is what is revealed to me. The woman sought her husband. Go ahead. uh, Sorry. Conceiving, that means there's going to be a new message. I don't know if it'd be a new message or a new revelation. Okay. Well, we we noted the parallel between um, the message of the birth of Manasseh, which which we used to for Christ, applied to Christ from Isaiah chapter seven. So when you take into context. The, the sinfulness of man. Uh, Samson is representing the final generation that's going to reflect Christ's character. Um, but, you know, we talk about how he fails these tests. And, and this is sort of the, the interesting aspect of it. Um, because in the end, is he not victorious? Yes. Okay. So what, what we imagine is we imagine the ideal. You know, we're Seventh-day Adventists. We accept the Sabbath. We get baptized. We obey God's commandments. A Sunday law comes. Uh, we, we don't obey that law, the law of man. We choose uh, God rather than man to obey. And, and we just imagine that we're going to move from strength to strength. Now, when we, we study righteousness by faith and we look at um, that Jesus in, in Desire of Ages, page 678, where it talks about he knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. Um, there is something... Um, Uh, for lack of a better word, ironic about the experience of the 144,000. That is, God is going to be preparing a people who are sinners to actually represent him to the world, to the universe, who are going to go through the same experience as Christ. They're going to be truly converted, truly dependent upon God. And, and Samson is, is illustrating human nature, the nature that we have to overcome by faith. So it's not, it's not as straightforward and easy as we imagine. The path is not, um, from our perspective, not what we expect. But we will be victorious in the end. We will represent Christ's character. But when we look at ourselves, we see no good thing.
Correct. <clears throat> the woman sought her husband, and after describing the heavenly visitant, she repeated the message of the angel. Then, fearful that they should make some mistake in the important work committed to them, the husband prayed earnestly, Let the man of God, which thou did send, come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou did send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. He hearkened unto the voice of rest. Yeah, and, 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 and the word is actually more a place of rest than just rest. Um, and, and we have the word Noah in there, right? We know Noah means rest. But Manoah would be more a place of rest, well, which, which would be the Sabbath. Now, Symbol. okay, now as, as a question, mm -hmm. in the Hebrew, with this with Manoah, is this being expressed in the Hebrew in the masculine or the feminine? Um, I was just looking at it. So it, it should be, uh, it's just a proper noun, and it, I can't, I would think it's, it's the feminine just because of the ending, but, uh, uh, I don't think it's, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I would just say it's feminine would be my guess. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, the, the reason that, that I asked the question, I am aware that the name of Noah in Genesis is Noah. Mm -hmm. And Noah in the, in the feminine is wanderer and not rest. So I look at this, that if, if this is rest, place of rest, mm -hmm. the symbol that we could take from this is this is someone that is believing in a place where they are not under the control of forces separate from God. A place of rest that we are all looking forward to. And isn't that the, the reason behind the message that we are looking for? that is going to have to be given mm -hmm. we are seeking this heavenly place of rest. Yep. And, and, and we can see in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, four, where it talks about this, I think it starts in chapter three, but uh, the entering into the promised land as being this rest is, is shown to be typical of the rest of the Sabbath, the sabbatical rest. Okay. So, so the entering into the land, the entering into the promised land, the Sabbath, in a sense, is a, um, a piece of heaven. Right, given to in, us by God. In Jeremiah 28, I believe it is, Hananiah has the rest. There's a two-month period. Um, so Jeremiah, you say it's 28, Hananiah the false prophet. Um, yes. Okay. She was, uh, he was, uh, giving a false prophecy of, of, uh, of, of rest. 
Yeah, I thought it was in the space of two. It says in the space of two full years. Yes, but he by the time he he gave it to the time he died was two months. Yeah, so the fifth month he gives it, and in the seventh month he dies. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So I think there's going to be a a, a period of um. Like the in the fall, we've had this false message for two years of lockdown, and uh, there's going to be maybe two months of something happening. But then we're going to go into the iron, iron yoke, hmm. which would be the Sunday law. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that we could just do that with this, though. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Um. But uh, I don't see how this would would tell us that we have two years and then two months. Because um, we know the Sunday law is not coming for quite a while. And this, this uh, Hananiah's prophecy, I would liken to the prediction of Colin more than anything. That's what it would parallel if we were going to give it as a parallel. It's a false prophecy. Why do you think the Sunday law is not coming right away? Well, because of all the things that have to happen in the movement. So we can't have the Sunday law coming if we haven't accomplished our task. There has to be a proclamation of the message to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have to have... Um, we have to have midnight in the midnight cry. So we have to have that, that message where um, uh, we see the other churches joining us to stand at the Sunday law. I think and, people are waking up right now. Well, waking up, but just like the Millerites, when they predicted the, the second coming as going to occur in the 10th day of the seventh month, they set aside all of the things that they had known about what has to happen before the second coming. And the movement had done the same thing. We've done the same thing. We haven't followed through with what we actually understand regarding the events that have to occur before the second coming. So for us to say that the Sunday law is coming when we haven't even organized our work in, in any stretch of the imagination, I mean, we haven't unified to organize. Our we haven't even given a message, yeah. right? So nobody's prepared for the Sunday law that's coming. Nobody this, even has the message. In uh, 18, uh, Genesis 13, 18, there's a secret being revealed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we know that there's a work that has to happen before the Sunday law. And we know the last ev events will be rapid ones, but rapid in God's yeah. sense is quite a bit different than rapid in our sense. So we have our lines continually point forward uh, to show that there's this work to be done. And, and yet the work hasn't been done yet. It's not even looking like it's even close to getting done in that sense. Nobody's doing anything. Um, so if we're going to be saying that a Sunday law is coming, but yet all of the conditions that that need to be met, we haven't fulfilled any of them, um, I don't see how we can talk about a Sunday law coming in 2022 or 2023. Nobody's ready. Nobody's been warned. And, and, the, and the whole point of this movement is to prepare the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the Sunday law. That, that Seventh-day Adventists, that they have a message that's going to prepare them to stand in the time ahead. And even within our group, I mean, I would say none of us are really ready to stand in that time. So if we're not even ready to stand in that time, and we haven't even given a message to the Adventist church, if the Sunday law were to come now, nobody would be ready for it. There definitely wouldn't be 144,000 righteous saints who are going to be able to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. So, I mean, I think that's what this message of, of Samson is about. It's about 
what has to happen to this movement to bring it from the condition that it's in to to eventually self dying because samson represents human nature but human nature that has a, a parallel with christ's human nature i think samson's the one that takes down their two pillars yeah right so so he has to represent the 144000 and, and so if we look at Samson and we look at this movement, we can see how we're exactly like Samson, which means we're not ready because we have three steps that are before us that we have to go through. And, and this movement also has to become unified. We, we still haven't even come to the upper room yet. So a movement that's divided against itself yeah. And, and that, yeah, and that hasn't accomplished its task, can't be speaking of a Sunday law that's imminent. And that would just be our own destruction and the destruction of everyone. I think uh, Daniel 1 and 2 explain it too. Uh, like the children are nourished by the Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's Babylon trying to feed, feed us their lies. Yeah, so so we and we understand because Jeff has, has clearly shown this that Daniel one, two, and three are the first, second, and third angels' messages. So so this is um, you know the third being the Sunday law. So yeah, there's a, this parallel here. So we know that God is going to prepare us, but He's preparing us with a message. And, unless, and that message is righteousness by faith, but it's illustrated through prophecy, and it becomes part of our experience. So, so if, the, if Samson represents the 144,000, um, this is the experience of what this movement is going to be. And this conception of this child, which parallels the conception of Christ, um, and, of course, of Manasseh. And we know Matt, Manasseh was the wickedest of all the Judean kings, and yet he typifies Christ. In his conversion, so this is the nature that we have to overcome. So I think, you know, if we're going to take what you're saying um, and we, we apply it, then we would have to see that there's still a there's still a great work to be done in our own lives before we're going to be able to stand at the Sunday law. In Daniel 2, 16, mm -hmm. um, he asked for time. So I think there's going to be a short space of time, like in this other one. And um, in 19, there's a secret revealed. Yeah, so, so exactly. So we have this time and this secret that's revealed in the night vision, which is uh, not a Kazon or a, a Mare or Mara. It's um, a, a different type of vision. But it's <clears throat> this night vision, which would be a, a more of a dream, right? Um I think is actually something that relates to um, the message of Nashville and what Nashville actually means. But we'd have to go into Daniel 1, 2, and 3 to understand that. But yeah, there is this, this uh, time, and that's what we have right now. And this is given under the second angel's messages. So we've been given more time. July 18th did not occur as we expected. On... Uh, September 11th, God gave me uh, um, an impression to look up Hananiah. Okay. Right, and Hananiah is important. So it's, uh, it's something that we have studied before, and we probably could look at that again. But I would think that Hananiah is representing the false prediction regarding Trump and the Sunday law.
and, there, and there's lots of reasons why. Uh, a whole bunch of things in actually in that chapter uh, about uh, time and how it's related to um, what's happening now. So, so maybe we could look at that in more detail in a later study. Is that is that helpful? Yeah, and I think it goes along with Luke one two, chapter mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Okay, Dwight. Okay. <clears throat> and God, and God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Why is it important that we know that she was sitting in the field? What can we take from this? She was not in her home. This was not her praying in a church the angel of the lord again comes unto her as she sat in the field and her husband is not with her and the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him behold the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day in order to report this to her husband, she ran. So, like those at the end of the world that are running to and fro, she is running toward her husband. Yeah, towards rest. I think she sat in the field Sorry, I think she sat in the field expecting the, the, the return of this angel. Like she showed faith by being there and waiting for him to come back. Like and also being in the field is like going about doing what the Lord would require of you. Okay. Would this kind of be us running from our home? Well, the home here, because Manoah means a place of rest. And this is where she, this is, um, this is the message, the message of the Sabbath rest. Um, so she would be running. Um, uh, I mean, this is, this is to give a message. I would think this running is what this is about. It's the giving of this message of rest. I mean, to Manoah. So, I mean, we, we, we haven't really, we have to go back to the beginning here and look at some of this because we haven't really dealt with all these symbols yet. Okay, how would you like to do that? I don't, well, um, well, we need to start at verse one again. Because because we didn't we went way too quickly through this. Okay. So we we're we're missing a bunch of context. At least that's the way I look at it. Because we just kind of skimmed through it yesterday. Okay. So let us do that then. Okay. Yeah. Can you guys hear that machine? Mm -hmm. The machine outside. Oh yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep my mic off when I'm not talking. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistine 40 years. Yeah, so this 40 years, we already addressed that. Um, the 40 years that they were fed the manna in the wilderness was a period of 100 uh, 14,440 days, one-tenth of 144,000, plus the symbol of 187. And that's uh, 40 biblical years less a month. 
that they were that from when the manna fell to when they went out and there was no manna and this 40 years also we can attach to um from the period in this movement from uh um 2001 uh to 2023 or 2030 let me see to 1989 pardon me from november 9th 1989 to 2030 that's a period of 40 years okay. and, and if we take that period of 40 years and we 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 go from november 9th it's going to bring us into um october of 2030 if we uh, let me see no it's october of 2029 it's going to bring us to i'm trying to remember this w without looking at it because i just did it yesterday um so if we were going to take this period of nine Nove time november 9th 1989 and uh, we're going to count this uh, number of days It's going to bring us to the 10th day of the 10th month in 2029, which is the beginning of the civil year. And we know that we have this uh, chronology that ties to uh, our history, to Colin's prediction, etc. That's going to be on the first day of the first month in 2030. So if you start the year on the 10th day of the seventh month, that would be a jubilee year correct right so so if we take this 2029 as beginning a jubilee year then the first day of the first month april 5th 2030 would be uh the start of the religious year within a jubilee cycle so i'm, I'm saying that this 40 years if we take it as a parallel with these the time of the falling of the manna it brings us to this 10th day of the seventh month in 2029 that now becomes this uh, symbol for that year. So we're looking at the, the civil year, but we also have the start of the religious year, uh, 177 days later, I believe. So if I remember, or is it 168? I, I can't remember how many days later. I'd have to look at it again. Uh, just hang on. Yeah, 168 days later. And 168 days is a symbol of what? What's 168 a symbol of, I guess I should ask? One week. A week, right? Because there's 168 hours in a week. So I don't think that we could take this... Um, because what I'm doing is I'm going and just uh, for people who want to look it up, if we go to 1989, November 9th, that's the 10th day of the eighth month. And so we're going to go 40 Jewish years later um, to 2029, and that's going to be the seventh day of the 10th month. So it's 40 years less a month on the biblical calendar. And that's going to be October 19th, 2029. And then we have 168 days to that April 5th, 2030 date. So I would say that this 40 years would have to relate to this, at least symbolically, in something that God has already given us. So this would be the history, this uh, this period of the oppression of the Philistines is going to be describing this history that we've already been given as a movement. Does that make sense to people? I think this is, is offering a point that we will later have to look at drawn out on a line yes and, and which i've been working on trying to sure. get this all together to show this but yeah so there's a bunch of things that have to be seen all together that have to be understood to see the whole picture okay 
Yeah. Now, <clears throat> from the Hebrew, and the children of Israel added to commit evil again in the sight of the Lord. This was not a consecutive sin. This was a cumulative sin. They knew that they had sinned and they continued in this sin. And the Lord delivered them into the Philistines for 40 years. So we have an identified time period under which the children of Israel came into judgment. The little note about this added. Okay. This is the this is the word Yasef, which is where the name Joseph comes from. Okay. Which means let him add. It's also the word in Leviticus 26, when it says, I shall punish you seven times more. Right. That word more is the same word. Yasef. Yasef. Yeah, it means to add or to lengthen or to extend or to prolong, right? So in this case, uh, the children of Israel uh, added or prolonged evil in his sight, in the sight of the Lord. So this is a period of time, a prophetic period of time, which we can see is now this period of 40 years. Now, isn't it interesting that the children of Israel wandered after leaving Egypt for 40 years, and here they are handed in, put, placed into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years? Yeah, and, and that's not a coincidence, of course. Didn't say that it was. Yeah. So, so this is, yeah, so this is part of a structure. And, and I know, you know, Stephen has worked out, at least tentatively, of the chronology of the judges. But I think now as we've started to go through this in much more detail, I think we can understand it better and actually figure this out in more detail. Because, well, you sent uh, Stephen an email and you sent it to me regarding some of these spans of time between different events. Right. And, and I think that we should be able to see in this period of judges um, a structure, just like we see in other prophetic events that we haven't really we haven't really worked out we've worked out part of it but not all of it well here's here's the the situation with this what was the accumulation what what was the ultimate event that took place at the end of the 40 years of wilderness wandering of the children of israel Well, the ultimate event? Yeah. I mean, there's the Passover and coming out of Egypt. Or, I mean, or you're talking about at the end of the wilderness wandering. Okay, never mind. So at the end, they're going to cross the Jordan. And then right. they're going to the Passover. And, and they've come out of Egypt completely at this point. Correct. Right. So that's going to be um, uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, where it talks about the 300 or 480 years of the coming out of Egypt, which is this period of 40 years that it takes them to come out of Egypt. Right, so this is at the end. They have that Passover at the end after they cross the Jordan. So is that the event you're talking about, the crossing of the Jordan? Or the That's Passover? the event that I'm talking about. Now, here we have the 40 years that the Lord has delivered them into the hands of the Philistines. What event will take place at the end of this with the 40 years of the Philistines. So we're taking the death of Samson at the end of the 40 years? I don't know. I don't know that I'd be taking the 
the death of Samson, but uh, would we not have the ark being taken? Okay. Would it be the birth of Samson? No, I don't think it could be the birth of Samson. I think it's, I mean, either the ark being taken or the death of Samson and the, and the two could actually be tied together. Could the 40 years represent 2000, uh, 1979 to 2019. I mean, we have a we have a literal time period there. I'm looking more at the at the figurative with this with the the 40 years with the Philistines. Okay, so one thing that we know is that there's this 300 years that's mentioned um, earlier, and there's going to be uh, this time that the Ark is in Shiloh, right? And then it's going to be moved. The Philistines are going to capture it, right? Right. Um, and, and she makes uh, some statements regarding this too, uh, a 300-year statement about the time that the Ark is in Shiloh. And so we have to we have to work out some of that chronology still uh, to sort of answer this question. But when um, when the ark is captured, we know that it's going to then um, be. How long do the Philistines have it? Is it seven months, or how long do they have the ark? I'm trying to remember all this. I, I think don't recall directly. Yeah, I think it's seven months, and then it ends up in the house of Joshua the Beth Um and then it goes to the house of Aminadab, and then it's twenty years there, and then we have Saul. So, you know, there's just a lot of obscurity when it comes to understanding this transition from the period of the judges to the period of the kings. I mean. Samson is the last judge mentioned in the book of Judges. But that's not really the end of the period of the, the Judges. No. So, so this time of Samson, because what we were studying um, in regard to uh, uh, Jephthah, there's going to be, let me see here if I can find it. Stephen's more the expert on, on this 300 years here. But, um, right, so it's going to talk there in Judges chapter 11 uh, that Israel, well, Israel dwelt in Heshbon, her, Heshbon and her towns, and Aurora and her towns, and in all the cities that be along by the coast of Arnon 300 years. Why for there, therefore, did ye not recover them within that time? Right, so remember. Uh, this is met the message of Jephthah to um, uh, Ammonites. So, um, and there is also the other. So Ellen White makes a 300 year statement. So they're not exactly the same period of 300 years. Right, Stephen? That's correct. I think there's about six years between them. Yeah. Okay. So, so that would seven be, years. Maybe. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, maybe seven years. So something around that time. Okay. So six or seven years somehow different. Um. And and that's going to be when we get to First Samuel. Um. Dealing with uh when the ark is taken. So, so there's some of this stuff that we haven't really sorted out where, how far is it from Samson to Samuel? And how do we make that transition? Yeah, just the, uh, the point that Dwight was making. Yeah. So 
when the, the Philistines took the ark, they brought it to the temple of Dagon. Yeah. Okay. Now, with Samson, is he not in the temple of Dagon when he brings the pillars down? Is that, or yes. is that another building? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. he's in the temple of Dagon. Yeah. Yes. So the ark would have had to have maybe been placed in that there time of Samson. You know, if it's going to be, it would have to have been um, taken and placed in that there before Samson destroyed the temple or else after that temple was rebuilt. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's something there, that a detail that we have to try to sort out. We also do have in 1 Samuel 6, 1, it says, where the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. So that's where we get the seven months for the ark, that the Philistines have the ark for seven months. So what we don't know is where Samson actually lines up with that event, the ark being taken. I would... I would submit before you that Samson destroys the ark or destroys the temple of Dagon and that it is rebuilt as a parallel with um, uh, The first city that is taken as we come into the promised land. Uh, Jericho. Jericho, yes. Okay, so I'm looking at a chart that I'd drawn out, a diagram of this, this history, but it was sort of a two different sort of periods. Because um, I believed that Stephen in his chronology, I think you had 369 years. Uh, that the Ark would have been in Shiloh. But Ellen White says 300. Oh, no. I'm, no? I would have went with 300. Okay. So so maybe I was misunderstanding this, because we have the Ark's in Shiloh, and um, but the dates that were given uh, when the Ark was taken, I'd have to look at your table of history. I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. Um yeah, I think we were trying to work out this. Yeah, so I, I have to go over this again because I don't understand even the chart that I've drawn out. I have two different lines that are that are, that deal with the 480 years, and it's um, I have a hundred. So what I have is I have uh, Moses makes the ark. It's 39 years in in the wilderness. It's going to go to Gilgal and be there for seven years. And then it goes to Shiloh and it's there for 300 years. And then it's in Philistia for seven months. And then I have 20 years, which I believe is the time of Samson. Is I think that's how I had drawn this out. And then from the death of Samson, it's 153 years to the foundation of the temple, which is divided as 69 years and 84 years. Or maybe the 20 years is not Samson. Maybe that's, um, no, that must be Samuel. Something to do with Samuel. I don't know. Yeah, there is a 20-year period mentioned. Okay. Yeah, so that must be Samuel. And then 153 years to the foundation of the temple. Um, and then seven years to the dedication of the temple. So I have this seven years, 300 years, seven months, 20 years, then 153 years divided as 69 and 84, and then seven years again uh, from the foundation of the temple to the dedication of the temple. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I have to, I haven't worked this out to be to understand it completely, but I think that's one of the things we're going to have to do. It, in in dealing with this period of the judges is try to work out uh, in greater detail uh, these different spans of time because because I know you did it Stephen and and yours could be right but we have to check all of that and see if there's something that we're missing 
Um, but because we don't know exactly where we place Samson. But he, he after a period of 300 years, unless he's uh, contemporaneous with Jephthah, but even then, you know, where would we place that 300 years in Samson's life? Does that make sense? What I'm asking? Um, I think, uh, yeah, we have to consider these things. I'm not too sure where Samson is in time. Right. So, so we don't know exactly where he is. Um, now, in the, in the chart that you had made in your tabled history, uh, adding up these years, you had had the eight years for the king of Mesopotamia, whatever his name is, Kushran Rishathayim. Um, and then you're going to have 18 years for Eglon and uh, Jabin, 20 years, Midian, seven years. Uh, these are the years of oppression, right? And then you're going to have the years that these judges reign or rule. Othniel for 40, Ehud for 80. And you have them sort of staggered. You have the Othniel and then you have uh, the years of oppression and the years of the judges. Now in Samson, you have the oppression and, the, and Samson uh, as being contemporaneous. That is Samson's 20 years as a judge occurs in the 40 years of the Philistines, right? So that's how yeah. you understood this. And then to add that up, you gave a running total that, um, that adds up to 490 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, or 300, pardon me, 390 years. Um, so, so that made a lot of sense. I mean, how you did it. But what we don't have here is we don't have where um, exactly how we place uh, Samuel. And, and, and in here, then, we would place the, the taking of the ark. It doesn't seem to fit in um, to this history, the 300 years. That's, that, that's the problem that I'm having. Because if I look at this chart, and I'm going to take the the ark when it's taken well it, it doesn't seem to fit that's where i'm having the problem mm -hmm. so i i think that maybe that period that you have there that's 390 years needs to be shortened and that we have to lengthen what happens after Samson, as far as Samuel is concerned. Yeah, the 390, I'm just sort of laying it out. As, yeah. uh, I'm not, not saying that, that all them judges occurred over that there period of time. We know that it fits into uh, like a 390, six year period is the period of the judges. Right. But I'm just sort of, sort of laying out the, the problem that we have Oh. If we just take them up, so obviously there's an overlap there with a lot of them. Okay, yeah, and so there has to be a longer period for Samuel. So the 390 can't possibly, yeah, so there must be some overlapping between these years of oppression and the time that these judges uh, rule. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so that, that's where I was running into the problem. So it's, it's something we're going to have to work out. I mean, I think it's pretty important to understand the symbols here and, and to understand where Samson is exactly. In a sense, you have like a, a symbolic representation of the time of the kings with the 390 and the 40. Yeah, yeah and I think, well, that, I think that was kind of your main point there in showing just if you take this number, the 390, um, which is, is, is sort of the total that you would come to just taking what's given there in scriptures. It is the period of the kings from uh, the dividing of the kingdom to uh, the siege mm -hmm. with the year and a half later giving us the 391 and a half. 
So it's the 390 years of Ezekiel's prophecy is based upon this total then, if that makes sense to people. Okay. So, yeah, I know not everybody's going to follow what we're saying, but I think when we go through this, we're going to have to go through this whole chronology and put it all into place. And and also just show how these line up with our lines. So so Samson is the last in the book of Judges because the other chapters actually go back to an earlier period. But then we're also going to have to deal with uh, the period of of Samuel and and Eli and where that falls into place. So, so were you saying, um, Dwight, as far as when the ark was taken, Samson's going to destroy the Temple of Dagon, then it's going to be rebuilt when they take when they take the ark and put no. it in the temple? Or as, it as, I was, as I was paralleling this with Jericho, yeah. Jericho was destroyed by the children of Israel and then was rebuilt, right? Yeah. So I'm asking, is it possible that Samson could have destroyed the, uh, the temple of Dagon? I believe it's the temple in Gaza. And either we have a different temple of Dagon where the Ark comes to it, or it is a rebuilt temple. So it's one or the other. Right. Um, and so that's why we need to understand where Samson lies. Right. That chronology. Because we know when the Ark was taken as far as... Um, what Ellen White says, the 300 years, um, that the Ark is in, in Shiloh. So at least that's what we're taking that actual period of time, not just a, a rough estimate. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, so that's the, that's the question we have to answer. And, and you're, comparing it to the rebuilding of Jericho. Correct. Um, I'm not totally following the, the significance of that, but maybe just be dealing with the seven times. Right. Um, but there's, in this it, case, would it not be the Sabbath as a symbol? Because of the Ark, remember the Ark has the Ten Commandments in it with the Sabbath. Right. So, so there's something about this Ark being taken. I mean, the journeys of the Ark themselves, we haven't really addressed in any kind of detail. Um, other than, you know, we know the 300 years that the Ark is in Shiloh and it was, you know, um, and that came there seven years. Well, it came, it was built, what, it's 39 years after it was built. It's in Gilgal for seven years. Then it's in Shiloh for 100. And, and then it's going to be uh, seven months in Philistia, in Gaza. And then it's going to be, um, for a time, in this guy's house, uh, Joshua the Bethshemite. Uh, and then it's going to go to the house of Aminadab for 20 years. And then there's going to be, and, and that part, I after that, I'm kind of sketchy. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I know it's going to be moved to the temple at the time of the dedication of the temple. Okay. Now, the ark in 1 Samuel 5, 1. Yeah. Is brought to Ashdod. Okay, Ashdod. Okay. 
five one. Where's Ashdod particularly? Um, that's going to be that into so that's going to be the temple of Dagon and Ash Ashdod. Right. And according to others, this would be situated between Ashkelon and Jamnia, about like thirty-four <laughs> miles north of Gaza. Okay, so it's near Gaza, and okay. So he's going to be in. Samson's going to be in Gaza. In, when he goes to Gaza, yeah, it's when he sees the harlot in Gaza. That's where he takes up the the gates of the city. Right. Now he comes on to he comes to Delilah, but. Delilah is not in Gaza. Right. She, she is in the valley of Sorek or Sarek, depending on, on who you're reading. Okay. So when it comes to the temple that he's of Dagon, um, it doesn't say where this is. I think we're, we're going to need to, to go through where we're at right now and keep this in the back of our mind as to what temple it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But the, the premise that I would look at at this moment would be that this is a different temple of Dagon. Yeah, possibly it is. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we haven't looked at the spirit of prophecy and all this yet either. With, with oh, that, we, we will. Yeah. So we've established that the children of Israel additively continued to commit evil in the sight of the Lord that we have a 40 year period that they were under the control of the Philistines, which is the antithesis of the 40 year period of wilderness wandering before they came into the promised land. And during this, at this time, the birth of Samson is now prophetically predicted. Now, at this, we, are, we now come to that there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. So as we look at this of Zorah, these are those of the Danites of the tribe of Dan that had continued to live not in the north of Israel, but in the southern portion of Israel, down by Judah. Do you, does anyone have a problem with that statement? Does anyone have a question regarding what I'm saying? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the question is, they were allotted land. Which was the original land they were allotted? Because they didn't want that land. They didn't want the land because it was going to be too hard for them to battle the Philistines. Yeah. So which land was that? Was that the land in the south? Yes. Okay. So then they took the land in the north. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so 
So, but there are still Danites in the south. Correct. And these are the ones that are being referred to here. Right. Okay. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. I believe we established so, just, go ahead. So that's a time of not much light, barren. I wouldn't disagree with that. I was looking at, at this, that when the, when Christ is saying, the angel of the Lord is saying unto the wife of Manoah, thou art barren and bearest not whether or not this was a type of a doubling. So yes, there was, there was no light. Now there's light being given, but is it a doubling of light? It's much like what was being said to Sarah too. You've been barren all these years and yet you will bear some. Okay. So this conception here, because we, we, we know that this is going to be um, parallel to that of Christ. Women shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, right? Which is about the birth of Manasseh, and who typifies Christ. And we have here a similar type of language. I shall conceive and bear a son. And so this would have to deal with the character of Christ that is promised to the final generation. So the character of Christ has not been revealed in his people because Christ can't come until his character is perfectly revealed in his people. So this is a promise of that uh character of Christ being revealed in the final generation. Right. Wouldn't be that, that wouldn't that be how we see this? I think it's necessary to approach it that way. Any other thoughts? So what else? Would you take, take the time of 40 years of barren. Uh, well, they wouldn't be have been barren for 40 years. Um, and the 40 years here is the time of oppression uh, that God is going to deliver them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. 20 of those 40 years is the time of Samson. Right. So there isn't 40 years and then 20 years of Samson. This is a period of time of oppression by the Philistines for 40 years. The 20 years of Samson occurs during that 40 years. The 20 years that Samson is a judge. Right, yeah. So we, we have quite a bit to cover before he becomes a judge. Yeah, so, so they're in the hand, so God has given them this prophetic period of 40 years and that they're going to be in the hand of the Philistines, right? God is, right. has basically appointed these 40 years for them. And it's during these 40 years, once it's begun, that Samson is going to be raised up. And he's going to be a judge, but it's during this period of 40 years. It's not added on to it.
Right. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts here? Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. What is being presented here in a very simplified manner? Eat God's word. <laughs> Isn't this the health message in a very simplified manner? Mm -hmm. um, then. So we have the right arm of the gospel being presented very, very simply. If Samson is going to do the work that God would have him to do, his mother first must adhere to the health message before Samson is born. Before we are able to give such a message we Would that re relate to the vaccine right now they were trying to feed us lies and we we studied and held held ground to the truth i don't know that i would apply it to the vaccine but how many of us are studying and accepting the admonitions that Mrs. White has given. Well, also, if you look at this 40 years, it can represent the four generations. Definitely. And it is true that God has a church that had, for the most part, uh, been following the health message, not completely in every circumstance. But for people who, you know, you know, I wasn't raised an Adventist. Um, when I became an Adventist and I would read in uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Med Canadian Messenger, so that's the Canadian yeah, uh, periodical put up by the Canadian Union, Canadian Union Med Messenger, and I'd read the obituaries. I was, it was always amazing how, how old Adventists were when they died, especially when they were generational Adventists. Adventists have lived a healthier, longer life, less morbidity uh, than the average population, and, and a lot longer because this health message was followed. But this is the mother of this child. And wouldn't the Seventh-day Adventist Church be the mother of Samson? Symbolically, yes. Symbolically, right? And, um, and he has this sign you know, that he's a Nazarite unto God from the womb, which is that he's not, he's, he's going to have this symbol, which is in his hair. Um, so this, this, this is a sign. This is a symbol. We have the health message, and we also have the Sabbath, the place of rest. And we have this woman who's, who's following this health message so that she can have a son that can be this deliverer, which would be representative of the 144,000. Could you uh, connect it to the year 1863? Because that's when the health message was given and the church was formed then. Yeah. So, so that's going to be 1863 is going to be the end of the first generation. Or, well, it's in the middle of the first generation. It's not the end. So if we took these 40 years, we could each 10-year period can represent 
the four generations. So it's going to be at the beginning of this 40 years that we're going to have this uh, child that's going to be promised and born. Considering 1863, um, would it would it be 1863 or 1860 slash 1861 for the health message? No, I mean, I, I know the health message is in, in, in 1863. That, that tracks. I'm looking at the 40 years because the mother would have been recognized as being barren prior to the health message being given. But you have this 40-year period. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be each of the four generations. I mean, right. The church has declared uh, Laodicea long before 1860-61. Right. About 1856, I believe. Yeah. It's recognized as being Laodicea. I'm just, I'm just asking a, a question off the top of my head. So, okay. Yeah. So here we have the health message, a simplified health message. Drink not wine nor strong drink and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. I think it's very important we need to be placing the emphasis that he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. If Samson shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines, who will deliver? Who will complete the delivery of Israel out of the hand of the Philistines? Would it not be David? Or am I looking too far down the road? Now you have like a, a victory where actually God intervenes. Right. Uh, after 20 years of Manasseh, oh, sorry, after Samuel. Uh, maybe he's not judged, but he's inaugurated sort of after 20 years after the um, after the, the ark is taken. Right. That time period. So there's like a, a victory there where God sends lightning bolts and so forth. And, uh, it, and there's like a word, a phrase or something that says that they had rest or something. The, the, the Philistines troubled. Israel no more or something like right. that there hangs on right. Samuel. Okay, so I would be looking too far down the road. So that's it, that's interesting as you bring that up, Stephen. Well, they do uh, we do see them then resurgent then in the time of David. Right. So Well, we see we see them resurgent in the time of Saul because Saul is not following God's law as he should, and it takes a David to stand up without armor, without a sword, without a helmet to then stand before Goliath. 
But here we have that Samson will begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So if the lightning, and as you were quoting, comes upon the Philistines, that's not according to man, that is according to God. So this time period then, where Samson begins to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines, and then where the Philistines trouble Israel no more. Is that not the work beginning with man, but being completed and taken into God's hands, as we are told will happen here at the end of this, this earth's history. Is that a non, not another parallel? Okay, so I take it that that's First Samuel 7? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so as, as you posted in the chat, and Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. 7-11. And the men of Israel went out of Mitzpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came unto beth Car, the house of something. And then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued. And they came no more under the coast of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So Samson begins the work, and the Lord completes it. Would that be a fair statement? Yep, that would be. <clears throat> so is that going to be a fair parallel in our time? Yeah, well, we have to look at, yeah, we have to look at some of these things here. Um, uh, I mean, that's a fair statement, but to look at the parallel, um, there's a lot more detail that has to be looked at on how we're going to parallel this. Well, especially especially as, I, as I'm looking very quickly with the verses that preceded what Stephen had posted. Mm -hmm. Because Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. So it was a lamb that was offered as a sacrifice. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to have to stop. I'm going to have to go here. Okay. So... Okay, so any other comments or questions at this point? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings, for the time that we've been able to spend together for the different items that are being revealed in types and symbols. We pray today, Father, for your guidance, and we ask, Father, for your blessing upon each that have attended this meeting and have participated. Help us now, Father. Guide us in that which you would have us to do. May your will be done. 
may we understand that guidance that you are directing for us. Help us now in that which we do. Bring us again together for further study and for further consideration. For this we ask, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.